fifties, affluence and consensus. Lecture terms. The golden age, focus question. What were the main characteristics of the affluent society of the 1950s? The Golden Age. A, quote, golden age of capitalism followed World War II in which economic expansion, stable prices, low unemployment, and rising living standards characterized American economic life. And this would carry on until 1973. In every measurable way, most Americans lived better than had their parents and grandparents. By 1960, a majority of Americans were defined by the government as, quote, middle class, and the poverty rate had dropped to one in five families. Innovations like television, air conditioners, dishwashers, cheap long-distance phone calls, and jet air travel came into widespread use. Former luxuries like electricity and indoor plumbing became common features for many Americans. Although the economies of Western Europe and Japan recovered after the war, the United States remained the world's industrial superpower. Major industries like steel, automobiles, and aircraft dominated the American and world markets. And like other wars, the Cold War increased industrial production and redistributed population and resources throughout the United States. The West, quote unquote, became a center of military technology production, and the South housed military bases and shipyards in the United States. In New England, new aircraft and submarine production replaced some of the jobs lost by the movement of textiles to the South. But the 1950s were in fact the last years of America's industrial age. Ever since, the U.S. economy has moved towards services, education, information, finance, and entertainment, while employment and manufacturing has dropped considerably. Union-led wage ri raises caused many employers to turn to mechanizing production in order to reduce labor costs over the years since the 50s. The number of farms in America also declined as well, even as new technologies in irrigation increased agricultural production. Changes in southern agriculture continue to reduce the number of agricultural laborers needed three million of whom, both black and white, left the South completely. What most spurred economic growth in the 1950s was a housing construction and spending on consumer goods. Boom. The post-war baby boom and population migration from cities to suburbs created a demand for housing, televisions, home appliances, and cars. By 1960, there were more suburban residents of single-family homes than people living in urban or rural areas. In the 1950s, the number of houses doubled, most of them built in the suburbs. Many Americans now realized dreams of owning their own home by purchasing an inexpensive house in a housing development in the suburbs. But suburbs were often centered around malls, which were accessible only by cars and were used for shopping and other private activities, unlike city centers that had multiple uses. Growth California best symbolized the post-war suburban boom. Between World War II and 1975, more than 30 million Americans moved west of the Mississippi River. One-fifth of the 1950s population growth happened in California alone. And in 1963, California surpassed New York as the most populous state. Quote, centerless western cities emerged, such as Houston, Phoenix, and Los Angeles, 
These were decentralized clusters of single family homes and businesses tied together by highways. Unlike eastern cities with central business districts and surrounding residential areas united by public transportation. In the new suburbs, life revolved around the car. People drove to work and drove to shop, and older city centers stagnated as a result. Suburban homes required lawns, so, so much so that today, more land area in the United States is cultivated in grass than in agricultural crops. Affluence and consumerism had never before so pervaded American society as it did in the 1950s. In a consumer culture, freedom became the ability to satisfy market desires. The 1950s was the culmination of a long-term trend in which consumerism replaced economic independence and democratic participation as central definitions of American freedom. Americans now happily accumulated debt in order to maintain a consumer lifestyle. And the ad agencies thrived on this. Anyone watch Mad Men? The TV world. Television especially spread the culture of middle class life and consumerism. By 1960, almost all American families owned a TV set, and television replaced newspapers as the most common information source about public events. TV became the nation's primary leisure activity as well. It changed Americans' habits and offered Americans of all backgrounds a common experience. TV programming almost always avoided controversy back then, and it depicted a humdrum middle class existence for the most part. Early TV shows that featured urban working class families were supplanted by quiz shows, westerns, and comedies set in suburbia, such as Leave it to Beaver. TV also became the most effective advertising medium ever, selling goods and spreading an image of the good life as one based on consumer goods. Buying a new car soon seemed essential to freedom and, along with the home and TV, became a consumer necessity for each family. By 1960, Four out of five families in the United States owned at least one car, almost always made in the United States. Auto manufacturers and oil companies became the top companies in America. Detroit became the center of the auto industry, sporting enormous factories with 40,000 or more employees. The car transformed American life. The interstate highway system changed Americans' traveling habits, enabling long-distance vacations by car. The result was an altered landscape of motels, drive-ins, strip malls, movie theaters, and roadside restaurants, including, quote, fast food enterprises like McDonald's. The car was an icon of American freedom, representing individual mobility and private choice. Women work in a divided society. Suburbanization reinforced the family as the center of, quote, the American way of life. And a woman's household roles were also determined by suburbanization. Most women who had industrial jobs during World War II lost them. And most women who worked outside the home remained in low-paying, non-union jobs, rather than better-paid factory jobs. Although the number of women at work slowly rose over time, more women worked to supplement their family's consumer lifestyle than working for economic independence. And their pay in 1960 was, on average, 60% of men's pay. It was widely assumed that the suburban family's breadwinner should be a male 
while the wife stayed at home. Popular culture depicted marriage as the most important life goal of the American woman. And women married younger, divorced less, and had more children than they had in previous generations. A quote baby boom lasted from the war's end to the mid-1960s, contributing to a 30 million increase in the nation's population in the 1950s. The family became a weapon in the Cold War as well. Government officials argued that women's confinement to the home separated the free world from the communist world, where women were required to work. Feminism seemed to have disappeared from American life and culture. The suburbs offered the dream of home ownership and security to millions of Americans who had suffered through the Depression and the war. It also promoted Americanization as ethnic Americans left urban enclaves and joined an America of mass consumption. But the suburbs were racially segregated. Although they differed in many ways, suburbs were almost always white. The racial segregation of suburbanization was the result of decisions by government, real estate developers, banks, and residents. In the post-war housing boom, government officials insured mortgages that barred resale of houses to non-whites. And when this was declared unconstitutional, private banks and developers continued the practice anyways. Urban renewal. Although Congress in 1949 passed a law to build almost a million units of public housing, the law set a very low ceiling on residents' income in order to limit competition for the construction of middle-class housing on behalf of private contractors. The terms of the law limited housing projects to the very poor. Along with the fact that white urban and suburban neighborhoods opposed the construction of public housing, this reinforced the poverty of urban non-white areas. Quote, urban renewal almost demolished poor neighborhoods in city centers in order to develop shopping centers, all white middle class income resident areas, and state university campuses. Whites displaced by urban renewal often moved to suburbs, while non-whites were unable to leave the inner city. Suburbanization reinforced racial divisions in America. Between 1950 and 1970, about 7 million whites left the cities for the suburbs, while 3 million blacks moved from the south to the north, expanding and creating urban ghettos. Half a million Puerto Ricans, many of them small farmers and laborers, pushed off the island by sugar companies moved to the mainland of the United States, and many settled in New York City. Racial exclusion reinforced itself. Non-whites facing employment discrimination and exclusion from educational opportunity were confined to unskilled jobs. As whites and industrial jobs moved out of the cities, poor blacks and Latinos stayed in the urban ghettos and became seen as centers of crime, poverty, and welfare. Suburban whites feared that any non-white presence in their neighborhoods would lower their quality of life and lower their property values. Anti-communism. In the 1950s, it seemed to many that America's major social problems had been solved. Widespread affluence, and narrowed political debate made for a comfortable and peaceful society for the most part. Business booms and busts, mass unemployment, and economic insecurity seem things of the past. Scholars celebrated the, quote, end of ideology and the victory of a democratic capitalist consensus in which all Americans, except a few fanatics, 
shared the same liberal values of individualism, respect for private property, and belief in equal opportunity. The only problems that might remain required only technical adjustments, not structural change. Religious differences now seemed absorbed into a common, quote, Judeo-Christian heritage, in which Catholics, Protestants, and Jews all shared history and values and contributed to American society. Freedom of religion was held to differentiate America from the anti-religious Soviet Union during the Cold War. Although the Judeo-Christian concept obscured the long-standing history of religious strife in American life, it reflected the decline of anti-Catholicism and anti-Semitism in the United States. An increasing secularization occurred in the nation. Although a majority of Americans were affiliated with a church or a synagogue in the 1950s, the highest proportion in American history, mind you, religion had more to do with personal identity, group assimilation, and the promoting of traditional morality rather than any kind of spiritual activity. Cold War freedoms, economic content, became centered on consumer capitalism or, quote, free enterprise. An economic system based on private ownership united the nations of the free world more than political democracy or freedom of speech. Even President Truman replaced mention of freedom from want of fear in his speeches with freedom of enterprise. The selling of free enterprise became a major industry that involved advertising, school programs, newspaper editorials, and civic activities. Talk of the virtue of free markets, however, ignored how government policies like federal tax subsidies, mortgage guarantees, infrastructure construction, military contracts, and GI Bill benefits all spurred post-war economic growth. New Ideas of Conservatism Although Americans had long worried that big business threatened their liberties, they were now told by government officials to embrace large-scale production as a way to fight the Cold War and enhance freedom by spreading consumer goods. Freedom was defined essentially as freedom of choice for the consumer. To many, America seemed to have become a classless society, a steep rise in the number of people investing in Wall Street inspired talk of a, quote, people's capitalism. Few could deny that affluence seemed to make poverty a relic of history. In the 1950s, a few intellectuals began to revive conservatism and reclaim from liberals the idea of freedom. Their ideas eventually defined conservative thought for the rest of the 20th century. Their opposition to a strong national government was fostered by resentments against the New Deal and its policies. These, what were called libertarian conservatives, defined freedom as individual autonomy, limited government, and unregulated capitalism. Their principles appeal to conservative entrepreneurs, especially in the developing South and West. Many businessmen looking to earn profits free of government regulations and high taxes and unions admired the writings of Milton Friedman. A young economist, Friedman in 1962 published his book, Capitalism and Freedom. In this book, he identified the free market as the foundation of individual liberty. Friedman gave this rather popular idea an extreme logic. He called for privatizing almost all government functions and for the repeal of minimum wage laws. 
He also called for the repeal of a graduated income tax and Social Security, claiming all such things went against the free market. Friedman criticized not only liberalism, but also the new conservatism, which was another growing body of the 1950s thought. Believing that the free world had to be morally and intellectually, not just militarily, defended against communism, the new conservatives and writers like Russell Kirk and Richard Weaver argued that liberals' toleration of difference was no substitute for the search for an absolute truth, quote unquote. They called for a return to a civilization based on, quote, Christian values. The new conservatives understood freedom as, above all, a moral condition in which individuals were responsible for their own actions. And they could be coerced by government if they did not make the right decisions. Although the libertarian conservatives and the new conservatives disagreed about priorities and the definition of freedom, they both united against the Soviet Union and liberalism at home. Conservatism in America was now defined by its opposition to, quote, big government. The Eisenhower Era. Focus question. How were the 1950s a period of consensus in both domestic politics and foreign affairs? The election of Ike. Dwight D. Eisenhower, known as Ike, was the most popular military leader to emerge from World War II. Eisenhower had led the American forces and the British forces in the D-Day invasion. Eisenhower supported Truman's candidacy for president in 1948, and in 1952, both parties wanted Eisenhower as their candidate because of his popularity. But Eisenhower believed that a contender for the Republican nomination Senator Robert A. Taft of Ohio, would turn America back to isolationism. So Eisenhower decided to take the Republican nomination. He chose as his running mate Richard Nixon of California, who, as a member of the House Un-American Activities Committee, had achieved notoriety through his anti-communist act activism particularly against Alger Hiss. Nixon won a Senate seat in 1950 by suggesting his Democratic opponent for that seat sympathized with communism. Though Nixon thus gained a reputation for opportunism and, in some cases, dishonesty, he also was a skillful, polit skillful politician who led efforts to change the Republican Party's image from defender of business, to champion of, quote, the forgotten man, the hardworking citizen burdened by heavy taxes and government bureaucracy. The 1952 presidential campaign was the first to show television changed politics, as candidates crafted images that were projected directly into Americans' living rooms through ads. Eisenhower's popularity dominated the election, however, and public frustration with the Korean War, along with Eisenhower's pledge to bring peace, won him an overwhelming victory over Adelaide Stevenson, the Democratic candidate. Four years later, Eisenhower again bested Stevenson in an even larger margin. But the Republicans did not gain power in Congress. And in 1954, the Democrats regained control of Congress and held it for the rest of the 1950s. Voters across the world elected familiar and elder leaders to govern them, such as Winston Churchill, made Prime Minister in England once again, and Charles de Gaulle in France. Modern Republicanism, 1950-1960 
With a Republican president, after a long period of Democratic rule, business once again heavily influenced Washington and the executive branch. Ike, an ally of business and a fiscal conservative, worked to reduce government spending in some realms, including in the military budget. But, while some Republicans wanted to roll back the New Deal completely, Ike knew this would be political suicide. Ike's domestic agenda called, quote, modern republicanism, was intended to end the Republicans' association with negative things like Herbert Hoover, the Great Depression, and social indifference. Instead, under Eisenhower, New Deal programs were actually expanded and the size of the government grew in certain realms. Free enterprise may have been a potent American weapon in the Cold War, but what Eisenhower referred to as, quote, the mixed economy, in which the government played a role in planning economic activity, became very popular, and not just in the United States, but also in other Western nations. The U.S. allies, Britain and France, expanded welfare, and they nationalized key industries like steel, shipbuilding, and transportation. The United States had a smaller welfare state than Western Europe, however. They did leave major industries in private hands, but government spending, such as the creation of the national highway system, ultimately boosted productivity and employment in the United States. The 1950s saw stability in labor relations as well. The 1947 Taft-Hartley Act reduced labor militancy, and in 1955, the powerful AFL and the powerful CIO merged into one big union organization, representing 35% of all non-farm workers in the United States. In key industries, labor and management now established what had been called a new, quote, social contract. Unions left decisions about capital investment, plant location, and output to managers, while the unions agreed to suppress unauthorized wildcat strikes in return for the employer's acceptance of the unions altogether. The employers also agreed to wage increases and fringe benefits like private pensions, health insurance, and automatic adjustments to cover rises in living costs. Though unionized workers shared in 1950s prosperity, the social contract ultimately applied to few workers. Unions won increases in the minimum wage, yes, but they did little for non-union workers in this period. Most workers did not enjoy the wages and benefits of union workers. Non-union employers continued to combat labor unions, and some firms still moved production to cheaper non-union southern regions. A 1959 strike provoked by steel companies in an attempt to reduce the union's power over production showed that by the 1960s, the social contract was weakening. Ike and Cold War Tensions Once elected, Eisenhower quickly ended the Korean War. But Cold War tensions increased, ultimately. In 1952, the United States exploded the first hydrogen bomb, which was far more destructive than the atom bomb had been. The next year, the Soviets had the hydrogen bomb, too, and both powers built long-range bombers capable of delivering nuclear weapons across the globe. Although Eisenhower was a professional soldier who hated war, his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, relished war. In 1954, Dulles updated the U.S. containment policy with his doctrine of, quote, massive retaliation. This policy stated that any Soviet attack on a U.S. ally would be met with a nuclear assault on the Soviet Union. 
This new focus on nuclear weapons let Eisenhower reduce spending on conventional military forces because the spending would then be on the nukes instead. During Ike's presidency, the size of the armed forces dropped, while the number of nuclear weapons increased dramatically to 18,000. Massive retaliation ran the risk that even a small conflict might rapidly escalate into a nuclear war that would destroy the United States and the Soviet Union altogether. Critics of this called it, quote, brinksmanship, but the reality that war would result in, quote, mutual assured destruction, or MAD, made the United States and the USSR more cautious, ultimately. It also spread fear of an imminent nuclear war. Government appeals to build bomb shelters in backyards and school drills where students hid under their desks covering their heads were meant to convince Americans that they could survive a nuclear war. What a joke, huh? But these only increased widespread fear. The picture here shows a little girl entering a bomb shelter in the back of the school. Though Eisenhower embraced Cold War rhetoric, he believed that the Korean War's end and Stalin's death, both happening in 1953, signaled that the Soviets could be reasonable and could be reached through normal diplomacy. So, in 1955, he met with the new Soviet premier, Nikita Khrushchev, in Switzerland. The next year, Khrushchev denounced Stalin's crimes at a Moscow Communist Party Congress. These revelations sparked a crisis of belief and confidence in communists worldwide, however. In the United States, uh, most remaining members of the Communist Party abandoned it. That same year, Khrushchev called for, quote, peaceful coexistence with the United States. But this thaw in the Cold War ended when Soviet troops suppressed an anti-communist revolt in Hungary in 1956. While some Republicans called for liberating Europe, once again, Ike did not aid the Hungarian rebels. He did not believe it was possible to, quote, roll back Soviet power in Eastern Europe. In 1958, the United States and the USSR agreed to halt nuclear weapons tests, and this would last until 1961. In 1959, Khrushchev even toured the United States and met with Eisenhower. But in 1960, tensions returned when the Soviets shot down a U.S. spy plane over Soviet territory. Emergence of the Third World Even though the Cold War divided Europe into communist and capitalist regions without war, it sparked competition and military conflict in what came to be called the Third World. The term was used to describe developing countries aligned with neither the United States nor the USSR that wanted to develop their economies without central government planning or free market capitalism. In the post-war period, Europe's empires crumbled. Decolonization in Asia and Africa began when India and Pakistan achieved independence from Great Britain in 1947. In the late 1950s, other new nations such as Ghana, Indonesia, Malaysia, Nigeria, and Kenya followed. In 1975, even Portugal, which had created Europe's first modern overseas empire back in the late 15th century, gave independence to its own African colonies, Mozambique and Angola. Facing decolonization, the United States feared that power vacuums in those former colonies, these third world territories, would ultimately be penetrated by Soviet-allied communists. Economically depressed areas 
were often vulnerable to communist takeovers. The Soviets supported the dissolution of Europe's colonial empires, and communists participated in national movements for independence all over the world. Leaders of new nations often saw socialism in one form or another as the best means to economic independence and narrowing social inequalities created by the imperialist system. While most new third world nations sided with neither power, the United States was admired by many nationalists for its own struggle for colonial independence back in 1776. Ho Chi Minh, who eventually was the communist leader of Vietnam's movement to end French rule there, actually modeled his 1945 Declaration of Nationhood for Vietnam on the Declaration of Independence. Origins of the Vietnam War In Vietnam in 1945, when the Japanese were expelled, the French moved to crush a national independence movement there, led by Ho Chi Minh. They wanted to reassert their own colonial control over Vietnam that they had had prior to World War II. Anti-communism pulled the United States deeper into involvement in Southeast Asia, as some of those areas were falling prey to communists. Following a policy set by Truman, Eisenhower gave billions of dollars in aid for French efforts in Vietnam, and by the early 1950s, the United States was paying for four-fifths of the cost of France's war in Vietnam against the communists. But Eisenhower did not send U.S. troops in 1954, when the French forces were on the verge of defeat. Rejecting National Security Council advice to use nuclear weapons, Eisenhower left France no choice but to concede Vietnamese independence. A peace conference in Geneva divided Vietnam temporarily into northern and southern districts, with elections in 1956 set to unify the country. But the anti-communist southern leader Ngo Dim Dim, at the suggestion of the United States, refused to hold elections, which both parties knew would result in a communist victory, where all of Vietnam would come under the communist leadership of Ho Chi Minh. Diem's Catholicism and his ties to landlords in a country of small farmers and Buddhists alienated many Vietnamese. And only U.S. aid let his regime survive. By 1960, Diem faced a guerrilla war launched by the communist-led National Liberation Front under the guidance of Ho Chi Minh. Aside from Vietnam, events in Guatemala, Iran, and other areas set a trend in U.S. foreign policy relations. The United States became accustomed to, quote, interventionism, intervention both overt and covert throughout the world in their struggles. Despite the Cold War language of, quote, freedom, U.S. leaders again and again allied with military regimes rather than democratic governments in order to keep an area from falling into the hands of communist leadership. In Guatemala, a series of military regimes ended Arbenz's reforms and began a period of repression in which about 200,000 Guatemalans died. In Iran, the Shah replaced Prime Minister Mosdegh and gave the United States and British companies 40% of Iranian oil re revenues. The Shah remained in office until 1979 when a revolution ushered in a radical Islamic nationalist government there. In Vietnam, the U.S. support for Diem led to the most disastrous war in U.S. history, 